In today's episode, I'm talking to Dan Peterson. Now, Dan owns a social media marketing firm, and since I'm also neck deep in social media right now, it was really cool to talk to somebody, and we actually went through pretty much an entire history of social media starting from 2010 going up until present day. And so I thought this was really valuable because so often times we have our businesses going and they get stuck in previous years of what worked and we fail to innovate. And so what's really interesting about this episode is you're able to actually see and hear all the different strategies and things that worked in the past that aren't necessarily working today. And I thought it to be a really fun educational topic. So let's go ahead and hop into that interview. Welcome back to the Deciphering Business Podcast. I'm here with Dan Peterson. Dan's been in social media for just shy of 11 years. Looks like I think you have an anniversary next month that marks 11 years in social media. Being in social media myself, I'm really excited for our conversation. And Dan, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks, Drake. This is cool. I'm I'm happy to be on. So you grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, and it sounds like it wasn't just your direct family, your nuclear family, it was also your extended family. So growing up in that, what did that exposure teach you about the needs of entrepreneurs while growing up around them? Pain and suffering. No, I'm just kidding. It was, (laughs) it just taught me a lot about just work ethic and the fact that you really have to have a passion for doing something at some level. Some people buy into a franchise just because it's a franchise and it's already built out for them and so on. And then other people create their own thing. And I feel like regardless, if you're really going to be successful, you have to have passion and work ethic. And so I, I learned that at a very young age. I saw it every day between parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, everybody working their butts off long days coming home six, seven o'clock at night sometimes. And only because they had me, I'm sure if I wasn't there, they probably would have kept working because there was plenty to do. So it was just one of those things where it really gave me a foundation. And then I built on that. And with the company I own now, it's been able to allow me to remember some of the issues, the pain points and things that they had in marketing and in sales and in just in work in general. And then I've been able to plug some of those holes, which It's actually the reason I started Flip Switch, my digital agency in general, was because Mm -hmm. of that. It was designed to to plug holes and to give entrepreneurs, small, especially small business owners, some kind of solution that was not over the top expensive, but not cheap junk marketing packages like a lot of the internet companies were selling at the time for like some ninety nine dollars a month type of thing. So we found this really sweet spot in the middle, and now almost eleven years later. Here we go. But yeah, it's an interesting history to look back on. Yeah. What were the specific holes that you noticed? Like in jumping into kind of the details of that and how that shaped the way you created a marketing agency? Because I think most good entrepreneurs are, they start something because they see a problem and they see a problem go, Hey, either I know how to do that right now, or I would love to figure out how to do that and take it and grow it. So what were some of those specific issues that you saw and how did you craft your agency specifically to address those? Yeah. So pricing was one big thing. I know that I grew up in the eighties, so I'm in my forties right now, but growing up in the eighties without technology, the old fashioned types of marketing that were out was yellow pages, newspapers. I come from a small town. So the local newspaper that was in our town covered that area 30 minutes outside of Champaign, Illinois, which is obviously a bigger town with the University of Illinois and stuff. So we could piggyback off of some of that from larger newspapers if we needed to things. So one of the big holes that I noticed as I got older and I managed other companies and I did other things was that there was not a specific type of marketing tool out there that was helping small business owners that wasn't either really expensive or garbage from a content standpoint. So going back to my point, like in the eighties, there was newspaper ads and things like that, right? That price point for those ads is what I went off of for the packages that we offer at flip switch even today. And so it was very much in that same range of knowing that one of the holes is knowing that small business owners don't have infinite pockets, deep pockets for anything. You got to wake up every day and decide how you're going to spend your money. So being able to provide something to them that was not a pain point. I didn't want them waking up at the start of each month thinking, oh, we got to pay flip switch. Is this worth it? Is it something that is making a difference or helping us? I wanted it to be a thing where they're 
over the moon, ecstatic that we're helping them. And just the other day, I got an email and it's exactly why I do this. I got an email that said, we're just super happy with everything you're doing. We just love it. So happy to be a partner with FlipSwitch. And I'm like, wow, that is, we don't get that very often. We get told, but not, people don't just write an email. They don't take the time to do it. So that was really cool. And it reinforces why I do what I do. So yeah, yeah that's a, I think the price point is a big thing for me Yeah, with that one of the holes anyway. Yeah, it was so interesting because for anybody listening, they don't have it right in front of them. You started in 2012 and I got into social media just a year earlier, right out of school. And what was super interesting about that time was print was still very heavy, right? So the magazine articles, you had people hitting you up on magazines and just the prices that you would pay for newspaper and magazine, you're talking anywhere from 1500 to $10,000 just for these static magazine ads and the magazine salesman would come around and they'd be like, oh, we've got a distribution of 15,000 people. So you're going to get in front of 15,000 people. And the owner's going, oh, that's awesome. But then they would run the ad and the phone would ring or they weren't really thinking about how to actually design the ads and the copy to where you actually had a specific phone number so you could actually track all this stuff. And I think that's one of the things that's changed a lot as you see a start to finish, right? I see you, the discovery process, I see something that you've done and then being able to like track that conversion. I think it's something that we've seen a lot of change over from those different areas. Have you seen that as well? Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the, probably the areas that we talk about the most, at least with our clients, where how are you set up to track this? When we start like a process of selling, quote unquote, selling social media to our clients, it's very much a reverse engineering diagnosis that we're providing up front before we try to drive people to your business. Because make no mistake, this is not an advertisement for my company. We're good at what we do. And we've had a lot of cases over the years where we've driven a lot of traffic to these companies and they're not ready for it. And they don't have a good website. They don't have any way to tell if we're sending people to the website, whether it's good or bad. And so we talk about that. What does the rest of your brand look like? And so website is a big thing. Having some kind of Google Analytics in place to be able to track where this traffic is going. Are they sticking around your website? Are they bouncing? And for your listeners, I highly recommend as soon as you're done listening to this, if you own a small business, have somebody else, not you, have somebody else check your website out from a third party, friend, family member, somebody that will give it to you straight and tell them to let you know how they feel about it. Does it flow evenly? Is it easy to navigate? Can you find what you want and get where you want to go and click what you want to click with one or two buttons and not have five, 10 pages in before you find what you want. And so that's a big tip for your listeners right there because it's still very prevalent. Bad websites are very prevalent nowadays. And I think it's because they go in cycles. Websites years ago were still relatively new. Let's just call it a decade ago for easy numbers. So everybody got their website and then a lot of them didn't touch it for five years. So that was five years ago and they might've got it revamped. Now here we are another five plus years later and it's that time again and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of websites that look like they were built five to 10 years ago. And that's not functional. And it's not what your customer expects because they have an expectation, just like we all do. When you go to a company, when you go to their website and feel something a certain way. And if you don't see and feel it that way, it's a subliminal block in your brain to bounce and get out of that website and go find somebody else that has a better setup. So that's the first thing we do is look at that. And then we reverse engineer backwards up to a point where we're trying to drive traffic to the start of the funnel, whatever that funnel is or that pipeline is. Yeah. Yeah. Websites are so interesting. I remember back when we started, mobile was just starting. Mm. Facebook pages were also just becoming a thing. And people thought of websites, we thought of them that way as your digital catalog. Instead of the paradigm shift of catalog to funnel, like you described, People were just viewing it as a catalog where we need to put everything that we have on there. You're a small business. You don't have a copywriter. You don't have somebody who can take something and move the customer from start to finish. It was just a, hey, here's everything we got, like a business catalog you'd send to somebody. And it's, here's our inventory and ready, go, as opposed to something that's guided. You're very much right in that regard. And it's because of that transition, right? It was the transition out of old marketing tactics, Again, newspaper, telephone, yellow pages, all of that stuff. It was that transition. People still had that mindset. And sadly, here we are 15, 12, 
whatever years later after social media and the internet and all that. And it's not changed a lot. It's amazing. I'm here in Chicagoland, so there's a million businesses. And every day I go to a website somehow that looks like it was the first one ever built. And I'm just like, how in the world is this company still doing this? How has somebody not come along and said, what is going on? Why do I have to zoom in and try to read the HTML text and all this? It just doesn't make sense. So I think that mindset is still there. And I think we're probably another five to seven, maybe 10 years away from clearing that and everybody realizing like, all right, it's digital. It's where we're at. And we've got to make sure everything's on board and tidied up. But it's crazy that we're even saying that in 2023. Yeah, it really is. I think that to a certain extent, that was part of the appeal of the different parts of social media. It was so much easier to create and craft and build. You had a direct link like to the people. You had a much more direct link. So a business owner who didn't know anything about their website, who didn't have the expertise to be able to create something that was a funnel, all these social media companies just figured, all right, we'll just be the landing page will be the landing page and allow you to interact and have a dialogue. You've been in this since 2012. What are some of the phases that you saw back then? If you could give a summary of 2012 to 2015 in social media, what was that like and where were we then? So funny enough, like it's almost hard to remember Yeah. at the nitty gritty level. Obviously I remember a lot about it, but like, for example, can you really picture in your head what Facebook looked like 10 years ago? I can't even remember what it looked like because it's went through so many iterations and stuff. But to answer your question, the first few years was to our earlier point, very much it was for ease of access, right? So the business owner could put this page up and post something and it would go to their followers and all of that. And the algorithm wasn't even really set up to discriminate yet. So it was very much, if you followed the page, you saw the content. And so it was very easy from that perspective, but it was so new that ironically, a lot of businesses weren't taking advantage of it, which is again, why I started the company and same as you, I'm sure. But it was very much a, a hurdle for lack of a better word for some of these business owners to wrap their mind around this because they were still in the web one early internet m mindset of that digital flyer being the website and that set it and forget it, let it be there, let people stumble across it if they find it, whatever. Social media gave them a way to be proactive and they didn't have that capability because everything to that point was set it and forget it. Newspapers, you put your ad in the paper, set it and forget it. It goes out. Once it's out, you can't fix it. Internet websites, the same thing. They set it up, it goes out and sits there. And while you can update it, they didn't. Some people still haven't. Uh, and then you've got social media, which was the opposite of that. It was designed to be fluid and dynamic and something that was that took a an active presence from the business owner so they needed to be on top of it and understand it and push it out but again the reason i started the company is because most business owners were and still are in their 40s 50s 60s 70s right that's like a common business owner age some in their 30s and a few in the 20s but that age range had never seen anything like this. And so they were still stuck in the old days anyway. And that was why there was such a need for an agency to come in and do that. Now, that was like the early few years. What happened in the next few years is really interesting because it changed enough for people to be dangerous. So what happened is business owners started thinking that they could do their own social media and they could be really good at it. And there was this early time of that when that was true because the algorithms still were at a point where everything was being seen by everybody. If you had a thousand followers on your business profile, you could post and 900 of them would see it or whatever. And so it was very simple and there was not a lot of thought put into it, which was the downside. People could just post something, leave it. And that was it. Then obviously now we're in this new phase where it's, there's 18 different social media accounts that you're supposed to have all at once and you're supposed to be on top of it all and you should be posting three to five times a day on this and video and static. It's too much for them to keep up with. And so we went the other direction now where now there's so many pages, so much to do. And that's really interesting. I think business owners in general, the best thing they could do for themselves is to spend some time and educate themselves. I feel like a lot of them stick their head in the sand and that's human nature, right? If you don't want to conquer something, you just pretend it's not there and maybe it'll go away, but it's not going away. 
So we tell people like take five hours on a weekend or in a month if you can't do it in one setting and just Google stuff and read stuff and spend some time learning what these platforms can do for you and specifically for you. If you're a flower company, Google like how do flower companies use social media to like, that's it. But they don't and hence flip switch and your agency and everybody yeah. else, right? Yeah, it's so interesting because just talking about the different time periods, I remember very clearly the websites and people even wondering, do I need a website? I remember that being the question like early 2011, probably 2011 to 2000, maybe 14, mm -hmm. really was like, do I even need a website? And websites back then were, you can charge anywhere from five to thirty thousand dollars for a website without blinking an eye depending on what they wanted to do all day and now you could hop on squarespace and for the low price of 49.99 a month you can have a WYSIWYG, what is what you get editor that just allows you to drag and drop and write and, and punch and do all that yep. and that was an interesting that was a really interesting change in evolution and when you described the part where the algorithm hadn't really kicked in yet and people were able to just start putting stuff out there and your page could have a thousand followers. Like you said, nine, 990 are able to see it. I wasn't really thinking about this at the time, thinking about it now. You have these business owners owning their own thing and they are deciding to manage their own stuff. Like, come on down to Joe's Crab Shack. We got some great stuff to, for you today. And you just see that over and over again, seven posts and now i'm thinking about it from the social media company side being like okay if we've literally just turned everybody's feed into this come down and get our stuff come down and get our stuff and that's half the posts they're seeing because there's so many pages i probably would have turned on an algorithm too to be like hey let's show people what they actually would like instead of these business owners seem to have figured out they don't know how to use it but they seem like they've figured out how to do at least that they're going to get eyeballs on it the, uh, the fact that from like 11 to 14 or whatever you want to say, like early on in the internet website days, whatever you want to call it, people would say, do I even need it? Is this a fad? Is it something that's going to go away? Is one of those mentalities. And now here, just in the last couple of years, I'm hearing business owners again say, I got social media. I don't need a website. Over and over, I'm hearing, I don't need a website. I've got Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. I don't need a website. There's so much more that a website should be doing for you that if you mm -hmm. think it's the same as Facebook, you're missing the point of the website anyway. That's a whole nother discussion for another time probably, but you just triggered that for me, like that memory of how that was a decade ago. And now I'm hearing it again, the same rinse, repeat thing. Oh, I don't need a website. I got Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. And I, I, I'm curious if this is where you're going, but what that evokes in me is the idea. And I know that there are some people that are, if you're, let's say a top 5% social media user, you can get away with that because you are so algorithmically entrenched yeah. that you are unlikely to see massive drops in traffic. You're able to get algorithmic discovery in a lot of platforms now where you can drive tons of traffic to your page, but if you are a slave to that algorithm, it worked when times are good, but you're not able to deplatform and build your own audience and have your own access to people without being subject to the whims of Google, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all these other things, because they right. tweak something and they go, all of a sudden, all that traffic you're getting to your Facebook page is now gone. Yep. And we hear it. I have this conversation probably once every week or so with somebody about, I used to post on Facebook and everybody would see it. Now nobody sees it and this and that. And we tell them like, it's not what it used to be. It's a different platform. It has changed. You have not changed. So the mm -hmm. algorithms can work for you or against you, depending on what kind of content you're putting out and what you're doing with it. But every company, every business, especially small businesses that are up against the marketing budgets of bigger companies, they have to be their own entertainment company, their own media company. They have to be putting out fun, engaging, relevant, entertaining, educational content and capture the attention of people in a second or two. It's stopping the scroll as they call it, right? You have to stop the scroll. So if you're a business owner and you're listening to this, one good takeaway is to reverse engineer what you're doing and look at it through the lens of your customer. Is your content going to stop the scroll? Is it going to get them to pause what they're doing, read or watch what you've posted? 
and then move on to the next post or are they just flying right by and that's it i guess the whole game of social media really it's all just attention and how fast or how much you can get your audience to pay attention to you versus scrolling on by it's very true and that's been the case essentially the whole time it's been probably the one most consistent thing about social media is that if you are unable to generate attention, then you've got nothing. This is maybe one of the things that some entrepreneurs have such a hard time with is because they come in with the assumption, they take their own biases of what I've created is awesome. And they then project that onto the customer to where they take everything and go, everybody wants what I have. And the reality is many people don't actually know that they want what you have. They don't always know why, and they don't know how you're differentiated from your competitors. And so if you're able to separate yourself and go, hey, how do I actually use social media when I'm using it just for me and not for my business? What are the things that I stop at and look at? What are the things that I am actually paying attention to? What are my own specific behaviors? And draw insights for those and take those insights and then put those onto you as now business owner, posting, strategizing how your good business is going to behave on there. I think it would change the dynamic tremendously. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, another thing, going back to your thing where you said we haven't talked about 2016 to 20 yet. Yeah. Th the big takeaway from that with between election stuff and all that, but also going into COVID and then just everything that went with that, there was a lot of reflection within social media communities from the tech giants themselves reflecting on their own platforms all the way down to the audience, like you and me, reflecting on how we're using it, how much we're using it, and all of this. So during that time, we saw a lot of success with business owners who were able to become more authentic and go back to their roots. And when I say roots, who they are as a company, literally who's running the company, like the face of the company. So we were telling business owners, like you need to get out from behind the desk and get in front of the camera Flip your phone around, make a video, and talk about your business. Talk about who you are and be authentic. It doesn't have to be polished, professionally produced content all the time. It doesn't have to be a $40,000 camera shooting a video. Just grab your phone and say some stuff about how you feel about your company that day or how you feel about the weather. I don't care. Be authentic and build that brand within the brand. And that's been a big thing now for the last five or six years, and it's getting more prevalent now. As we move through 2023 and we continue moving forward, it's going to be the name of the game and the algorithms prefer it too. So the algorithms want authentic content. The audience wants authentic content, yet business owners can't get out of their own way to produce authentic content. They still want to overthink it, make it too polished, make it whatever they think, to your point, what do they think it looks good? What's good for them when really they should be thinking what's good for their audience? So, yeah, it's been a wild shift over the last few years, but I think it's a lot for the better. I think it's really a lot for the better. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, and I look at 2016 and 2020, what was interesting about what happened then is all of the big players had solidified their existence. They weren't super concerned about, everybody had dug into their own trench. So Facebook was Facebook. Was Facebook. It was firmly established as Facebook. It wasn't seriously trying to compete with any of the other ones. Instagram was doing photos. Facebook was doing tons of text. LinkedIn was where you went to get a job. YouTube was videos, long form video. Google was still king of search. But I think this, where these companies had become their own large icebergs that were slow moving and you really saw them start to turn on the monetization features a lot. And so you saw because they were competing with each other, but not over the same type of ground. And so I think that was really when you got to see pay-per-click, pay-per-click and ads, ad rates and algorithms start to clamp down. The algorithms clamped down and people were starting to really see a ton of success with a ton of success with paid ads. And part of that was because they had reached maturity to where they were still able to use all the data that they gleaned to do all the hyper targeting. Right. And each platform had its own niche within its vertical, but also with its own audience. So therefore 
I think from a business owner perspective, where I always resort going back to because that's who we serve, I feel like it was easier for them to find that platform, use it, and then get along with their day type of mentality. Whereas now you've got all of them, and when I say all of them, I'm talking Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube with shorts. All the major players have cross-pollinated so much with their platforms that it's really confusing for the business owner. They're like, now what do I do? Now I have to be on all of them. Whereas before, if I was B2B, I was on LinkedIn and probably Facebook. Now it's, no, you need to be on everything because everything services everybody. It's just a different type of creative. You have to come up mm -hmm. with a different type of content for each platform because the audience expects something different. Even if the audience was the same, their expectation is different. What you feel on LinkedIn feels different than what you want to feel on TikTok, which is different than what you want to feel on Instagram and so on. So yeah, it's a really crazy thing because it's changed how people spend their ad dollars because now they feel that they can't spend enough. I know that I just had this conversation the other day. One of our clients said, we don't feel like we can spend enough money to cover all the bases anymore. It used to be we ran some pay-per-click on Google and we ran some Facebook ads and that was good. Now we've got to think Instagram because Instagram has aged up and is now in that 40s, 50s, 60s grouping. And because they've changed and they're really focused on video and this place I'm talking about does like event bookings and things like that. So they're big on video. So they got to be on Instagram too. So now they're paying for Facebook and Instagram and they're still trying to get executives and corporate HR people to book corporate events in this place. So they still go on LinkedIn and they, they're still trying to reach the HR executives and the people that make those decisions there. And it's like they just can't get everywhere and they feel like their budget has been thinned out. Whereas mm -hmm. it used to be able to be segmented and be a lot more effective in their mind. Yeah. And I think a lot of that has to do with the big thing started shifting towards the end and Apple kind of spearheaded this was the privacy, mm -hmm. right? The promise of social media for the longest time has been, we have all the data, so we're going to hyper-target everything. And so we can hyper-target to your specific audience, whether it be men 30 to 35 who are interested in these specific things and that hyper targeting with people starting to care about privacy and apple starting to competitively erase that mm -hmm. and obscure that all of a sudden now you don't have as good of accuracy in the actual insights on the platforms themselves and so as a result of that you have to spend way more just to even build and discover your audience because of the way the new algorithms work Right. So here's a good tip for that. Go organic as much as you can. If you're listening to this and you're a business owner, go organic. And what I mean by that is don't think that paid is the end all be all for what you're doing. Organic means in the small business world, you can just think free. All right. So organic means you get in the dirt, you get in the comment sections and in the Facebook groups and all the places where your audience might be. And you comment and you start finding people on the pages that you service. So if you're a small business with a five mile radius around you, where your business really comes from, let's say you're a pizza place. So five, 10 miles is it because nobody's going to pass up 50 other pizza places to get to you probably, unless it's some really good pizza. But yeah. they're going, if you go hyper local and you build an audience and you nurture that audience at an organic level, you don't have to spend as much on ads. Then when you do pay for an ad, it's something different. Whereas right now, what a lot of businesses do is they do the same thing in an ad that they should be trying to do or accomplish in just their day-to-day -day organic social media usage. In other words, they're putting out content in an ad format, paying for it to show up in people's feeds, when really that is no different content than what they're already posting to their page, which is basically what I'm talking about here is the boost button. They're basically mm -hmm. just posting and then every once in a while they'll boost something because they think I got to put some money out there. So they don't have a strategy. They click boost. They pick a generic audience and that post goes out, returns no tangible results most of the time, unless you get lucky. And then they think Facebook ads don't work and they quit doing it or they keep doing it and waste the money anyway, because it's not working that way either. It's not working because you're not doing it right. So what I tell people and what we try to focus on is organic reach and engagement, getting in the dirt, 
getting in the comment sections and Facebook groups and finding your audience at a one by one level instead of trying to run some junk ad that targets 50,000 people. Part two of that, when you do run the ad and it, you're going to do that route and pay, spend some money, make sure that you have a goal in mind for the ad, not just a boost and show it to everybody. Pick something, for example, here's a great real world example. That same client that I just talked about, the event space place, we said, give us three dates that you want to fill this in the next like couple months or whatever, because we're, they book months out in advance. So they need their audience normally wouldn't be booking these dates because they'd be too close. And if they don't get booked, obviously, then the business doesn't make the money on it. So there's nothing to lose here. So give us three dates that are coming up quick that if you don't fill them in the next week, they're probably not going to get filled. So they gave it to us. We ran a specific ad that, hey, we only have these three dates available right now, and these are super popular dates, and they're going to go fast, blah, blah, blah. Within 24 hours, the second out of the three was booked. Now the third one, as of now, has been booked. And that ad was like 100 bucks. So they booked, I don't know what an event cost, let's say 10 grand. 20 grand in new business came in, potentially. Could be more, could be less. But thousands of dollars from a $100 ad that was specific, not just boosting some post. It was, here's three dates. They're going to go quick. Audience, you pick one or forever hold your peace. And that was it. And that worked. And that's just an example of how strategic you should be with ads versus just clicking the boost button and expecting it to work. Yeah. Yeah, and it goes to basic business principles if hey let's start a new initiative okay what for because starting sounds fun you wouldn't agree to that if you're a business owner and one of your employees came to do that hey let's do this thing why and but you're reacting and trading all of this the same way with your ad spend what's the point you need to have an easy way for the customer to hop on that journey and start that journey knowing where they're going and what they're going to get as a result of that and i think that the customer buying journey is a very interesting thing and I think it's been interesting to see over the last three years how organic has grown tremendously and how that has run in parallel to, I would say, declining effectiveness of ad budgets. Because if you have something that is universally applicable, you have an audience that's too general, too broad, you just be throwing good money after bad. And I think during that time, 2016 to 2020, you really saw the rise of the, the growth hacker, the the growth hacker, the guy who was super focused on marketing ROI, and they're like, all right, I'm spending this, what's my ROI? And that seems to have been a pervasive question. During those years, you could really hyper-target, and you, the ROI was, was pretty easy, put A in, get B out. But that's all changed a lot now over the last three years with the obscuring of the data. Yeah, yeah. It's changed the mindset of marketers and it should change the mindset of small business owners, but I don't know if it's, I don't know if they're in that, if they get that granular with things. I think that a lot of business owners and especially small to mid-sized companies, right? I'm not talking larger companies that have departments and all that. I think a lot of smaller companies get too caught up in the day-to-day because -day they have to, or they don't have a choice, mm -hmm. right? But that's it. Whether you have one or 10 locations, you're in it. And to take a step back and try to look at your KPIs and your CAC and your, like, they don't do that. They can't do that. So therefore, they can't possibly be running relevant and effective ads at any kind of scale, right? The ROI on an ad when you don't know and can't track anything from whether your website has a call to action and you're looking at Google Analytics or anything or all the way to the social channels that now have been strangled by the big tech companies and you can't reach and target people like you were just saying as easily as you could a few years back, that ROI has changed. And I think nowadays, one of the, the returns that business owners should be looking at shouldn't necessarily be tangible dollars as much as it used to be. I think that people get too caught up on that and they forget to build brand and forget the long-term strategy. For some companies that plays in with like the lifetime, the LTV of a customer, and they should be looking at the long-term strategy because that customer is going to stick with them for a long time and that's how they're going to make their money back. And then for other more transactional businesses like the pizza place and things like that, 
even with the pizza place, it's about brand, right? I happen to know there's a pizza place down the road for me. There's 23 pizza places that are the competitors in my area here. 23. Now, if you're going to build something and break through that, if you're going to build brand, you better be darn good at it because you're up against not only the Domino's and Papa John's types of the world, but you're up against 20 other, especially in Chicagoland, 20 other yeah. mom and pop pizza places that are all vying for the same middle-class family that has pizza once or twice a week. It's so hard to break through. And if every brand takes that pizza place model, and I don't care what you sell, what you do, if you break it down to its nitty gritty, the roots of it, you need to look at your brand at a 30,000 foot view. How does your audience see it? How do they perceive you? What are they looking at? And how can you then translate that into the content you produce so that it targets and lands with the audience that you're trying to reach and it lands in the right way so that they want to do business with you and stop looking at, Hey, let's push out a post and hope that five people come in and spend money. It's just mm -hmm. not how social media works anymore. And, yeah. uh, and it's really having a negative effect on businesses. They're too caught up in the tangible financial ROI versus brand. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really important point because I think they're looking at it to granular way. And what we've seen over the last three years is there is a tremendous amount of opportunity because all these companies are now 2020 to now. I think what you've seen is Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. They're all starting to fight over the same territory now. And right. I think that territory is short form video. And people get caught up in the details of I ran this ad for $1,000. How many customers came in and what was my exact ROI? One, you're not operating, if you're spending a grand, you're not operating at the volume that you need to justify a meaningful ROI because your ad targeting is not as precise as it used to be. And two, if I were to tell you that by putting out some good creative, you could fill, in my case, Thunder Arena with 18,000 seats mm -hmm. and all those people saw your stuff, you mean to tell me that by putting good creative in there and brand awareness, you're not going to sell some pizzas? Right. And that's where you can actually break through the noise and how you're doing that now is by putting out actual interesting short form video or whatever contextual platform relevant content that's on there mm -hmm. or required that they're trying to favor. And like I said, in many cases, it's short form video. Like that's where you have opportunity and that's focusing more on the brand and the creative instead of these little nitty bitty potholes that are your ad spend. Yeah. Here's something interesting that I think we're going to see in the next couple of years anyway, sometime probably mm -hmm. 2024, 2025, maybe if I'm right, we'll see. I think that because all of these platforms are starting to merge their methods and their audiences and everything else, I think that there's going to be some major fallout of one or two of them. It just isn't sustainable. I don't think it's sustainable to have, let's play pretend here, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube shorts, and maybe even Snap thrown in there with this, but definitely those four, having them all producing the same type of content or you as an audit or as a business having to produce this same type of content, but whoever's creating it, doesn't matter if it's a person or a business, to all be focused on short form video and running that and that's what the algorithms are pushing and so on and doing away with a lot of the more static kind of content, I think is at some point it has to hit some kind of cap. It just can't go on and on forever because there's only enough time in a day to watch so many videos. And now I'm starting to see the same videos show up on multiple platforms anyway. I'll be on Facebook and I'll see a video I just saw on Instagram, which I just saw on TikTok, especially the other way around, right? Like a lot of TikTok videos that get shared to Instagram story or mm -hmm. Instagram reels and Facebook reels with the watermark still on it. Yeah. That's the same thing. I just don't see it being something that can continually go on and on without some kind of segmentation happening, some major segmentation in the next couple of years. I think the algorithms are going to have to be a little bit more accurate because I think now what we're seeing is instead of being social media, it's more interest-based media. And I, I talk to people about this and I go, okay, let's just take a second and think through what kind of commitment level you have for the different types of content. Post, I see Facebook post, I click like, I may comment, I move on, five seconds done. Instagram post, I see photo, I click like, I move on. I see video, hang on there. If this is a video that's anywhere from 30 to 90 seconds long, 
that takes a good bit more commitment and all of a sudden don't care that my long lost friend from high school that we've been Facebook friends for 10 years, I don't care what he thinks or is interested in and the social ties start to drop. I just care about focusing on what I'm interested in. And I think this transition from social to interest-based is going to be a really interesting paradigm shift for brands and marketers and business owners over the next five years. Yeah. And I think it's going to do something else too. What I think is going to happen is it's going to open up a door for one platform. Maybe it's not even been built yet, but maybe one of the big ones right now is going to have to go backward to the social graph again so that there is a platform for it. Because to your point, Mm -hmm. as everything moves to the interest graph and all the algorithms are just bringing into your feed stuff that you're watching, it's just all it is television, right? Like we're just watching it. Is it, they say Gen Z spends anywhere between, I've heard different numbers, 80 minutes a day. I've heard five hours a day, but probably a couple hours a day, Gen Z spends on TikTok, not to mention the other platforms that they might be on. So it's their way of watching content, be it television style or not. And to your point now with the social graph going away, where is that attention going? Where are people going that want to still see the stuff from their cousin and their aunt's party and all the stuff, family and friends related. Right now, that's still very much Facebook. But if Facebook continues to go the route of TikTok and everybody else, where is that? There's got to be a gap there somewhere that's going to be filled. And ironically, Mm -hmm. as we're recording this right now in 2023, Facebook static posts are back. The algorithm has swung back that direction, and now static posts outperform a lot of the other posts on Facebook because I think there is that desire for people to see stuff that they used to see and keep up on it. Where I think the Mm -hmm. algorithm needs to improve in that department is it needs to stop showing stuff and pulling stuff in that's outdated. More and more, Mm -hmm. at least in my feed, I'm seeing stuff from three to five days ago all the time, or I'm seeing duplicate content. Like the same, mm-hmm. I'll refresh my feed and it's like the same 20 posts. And then the next day I'm still seeing half of them. That's not entertaining for me. That's not going to keep my mm-hmm. attention. And without attention, that platform fails. So that's why I go down the reels and the rabbit hole, right? And the videos, because it, I don't see the same stuff very often and it's entertaining and so on and so forth. But there's some interesting yeah. stuff that's going to fall out here at some point. Yeah, I agree. And what's in, oh, I, I tell you what's been probably one of the more interesting things is the way that short form video has changed video production just in general. If you look at the way, as an example, recipe videos, right? So you watch a recipe video on YouTube and then you watch a recipe video on TikTok or a short or a reel or wherever. And you're like, wait, I just watched the same entire recipe in less than 30 seconds that is a 10 minute video on another platform. Good point. That I think is really interesting. And what it's doing, obviously the big behemoth that it's affecting is the movie industry. Have you noticed or seen any of the ways that all of a sudden, boom, that's changed the way video production actually happens? Yeah. So on a smaller scale without looking at actual movies and that type of thing, but just on a small scale now, we're starting to see a swing back from professional video, so to speak, like the $40,000 camera I mentioned earlier. And with the proliferation of iPhones and the technology that these cameras are so good now on your phone. And the fact that Apple, for example, makes a TV commercial with their phone to show you what can be done. I think that there's a big shift in the need and desire for professional made videos, right? I think there's a shift in the small business owner's mentality and the audience, not even the business owner, but like the audience, their mentality of what they expect to see. I don't expect to go on any of these platforms and see a professionally created video. If I do, especially if it's somebody who's like a one-off creator that did it, I'm like, wow, that person's really talented. They really did something cool Mm -hmm. with their phone. 90% of the videos that you watch in your feed, they're not professionally created. It's TikTok, it's, it's Reels. You use the editing capabilities that are in the app itself and that's it. You're not bringing in a camera crew and all this. Now my company, we have a camera crew and all that and there's definitely room for big videos and we are doing that. But I'm telling you like at a smaller scale, we're seeing a lot of stuff just done with the phone. And I think that yeah. mindset is there now, like the non-professional mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting to see like how 
I think that for the longest time, videography was a derivative of the film industry, right? So we have B-roll, we have establishing shots, we have the panning shots, all the different things. And as people who were videographers were wanted to be filmmakers a lot of times, and now social media has been around long enough that you're starting to see people who are social media video natives and just the differentiation that the way that those videos are done versus something that is, like I said, a derivative of the film industry, I think is a really yeah. fascinating progression. That is interesting. I've noticed yeah. it now that you mentioned it, but I've never thought of it. That's really crazy. You're right about that. And we are starting to see yeah. that new generation come through with, it goes to my point of expectation, right? The audience doesn't mm -hmm. expect to see anything different. And I think yeah. five years from now, it's going to be even more so where what is a professionally produced video? If I just, it, our attention spans can't handle it anyway. If I go to a theater, yeah. yes, I want to sit down and watch a movie. But if yeah. I'm on my phone, I don't need it to be that polished. Yeah. I, need, I need the content. And what I love, that what I find very interesting and is, so you think about these established industries, right? They're established industries that they have to do things to justify their existence. And so the movie industry, the number of movies that are created and you actually start watching and you're like, oh, this is actually not that interesting. But because the movie industry exists and there's this many professionals that need to be employed. And so in order for them to justify the dollars that they're raising to produce films, they're just trying to fill the ecosystem with as many movies as they can in cable news to where the idea of 24 hour programming is insane. Like when you think about an actual cable news show, like how many Lifetime movies, Lifetime goes, okay, we have 24 hours in a day to fill. We have to do that 365 days a year. We have this much content that we can recycle. If you just look at it by the numbers, it is super interesting how at some point the thing gets big enough and mature enough to where it's not even about the audience. It's about sustaining the system that is in place. Yeah, you're right. And, and on the flip side of that coin, going to the attention side of it, right? Because that's what drives a lot of it too, is the, you have the OTT services, the streaming services and stuff. And how many of those can we handle before there's just no more room? And yeah. right now, what is it? like Netflix, Hulu, Paramount Plus, Disney Plus, YouTube alone. My kids don't even watch anything but YouTube. YouTube is their cable. And that's me. Yeah, that's it. So yeah. at what point... Do we hit a point of diminishing returns here where not just the movie industry, but TV and entertainment in general becomes so saturated with stuff and you can find the same shows? It's really going to have to go the way of segmentation, like I said earlier, where you have certain channels that are certain things and they've got their licenses, like YouTube licensing NFL stuff and things like that. Like it's going to have to go that route. But even at that point, there's only so many things you can license. And there's only so far you can go before you're out of shows, you're out of movies, unless to your point, you fill it. You just keep filling the yeah. machine with content. It's, it's yeah, crazy. It, it really is. Because just when you think about it, so the big promise of streaming services, right, was save money off your cable. Now, if I have to have, if I have to have Netflix, if I have to have Hulu Plus, if I have to have Disney Plus, if I have to have YouTube Premium, if I have all of a sudden now we're getting back up into the same prices and Netflix can't fill as much time as a traditional cable provider because then you got Paramount Plus, you have Peacock with yeah. all the NBC stuff. And then now every sports league is trying to do their own streaming service. It's going to be interesting to see how much farther that pushes before we end up seeing some sort of pendulum swing back to where they all talk to each other. Like, hey, we should all bundle together again. Right. That's exactly my point. Yep. I think it's inevitable at some point. Or the marketplace is going to speak and half of them are going to go out of business and then they're going to gobble up the other ones are right. Look at, so Paramount owns CBS, Nickelodeon. What else do they own? MTV, maybe? It's not, I don't know. And like ABC, ESPN, Disney, and all that together. And at some point, somebody's going to have to eat somebody else to keep the machine going because there's just going to be too much. Like you said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be too expensive. You won't be able to pay for it. And then you're picking and choosing, but you want one show and one movie that's like HBO Max, right? Game of Thrones mm -hmm. stuff. So there's another yeah. one to throw on the list, HBO Max. I mean, it's just yeah. nonstop. And I'm paying for all of them right now. And I told my wife, I was like, what are we doing? Like, I don't even want to know what we're paying for all of this stuff. If I'd add it up, it's probably, I bet cable and all of it is 600 a month. And I don't Oof, even watch yeah. it. I watch Cubs games. That's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is on none of those. So it's what it's going. 
And it's hilarious because then people are using different programs, different series, different things as loss leaders. They have one specific thing that you want. It's the loss leader that allows you, that will actually pull you into pain for the platform. And then all of a sudden, oh, I forgot. I didn't cancel that because we could finish that show. That's, That's HBO Max yeah. for me. That's so interesting. It's crazy. It's um, attention though. It's a, and for going back to your show here so that we're talking to, I want to make sure I'm giving some value. If you're listening to this and you're a business owner, what we just talked about is how you should view your social media. You have to be mm -hmm. your own network. You have to be your own media company. You need to be producing content that's entertaining, getting people to watch it and consume it and share it because the more they share it, the algorithms like it and so on. And that's how you have to think about yourself. Now it is not 2012 and this is the, it's the day and age of attention. Yeah. yeah. And I think the other paradigm shift that'll happen too is in the past, you've used social media to generate business. But with all the boomers retiring, we're getting ready to have more, a much higher percentage of digitally native population. And so you not only have to think about just from earning business, but what you're going to have to see with all these boomers retiring and the labor shortage intensifying which between now and 2034, it'll go from 400,000 to 900,000. You should also be thinking about how am I putting out content to attract workers? Yeah. Because for workers and talent, you're going to have intensifying competition to where how are they going to decide whether they want to work at your business or another business? The idea has always been that because there's been plenty of labor available that I just put up an ad and then the ad gets filled with jobs. But when we go into a worker shortage now, you have to actively be looking to recruit the best talent and offering more transparency into your business, into your leadership style, into the way that you run things. And you have to be trying to magnetically attract the talent as opposed to just trying to win business from it. Because fulfillment with a labor shortage is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. Yeah, we're already seeing it. And you're right, it's not going away unless that pendulum swings back at some point with something. I'm not sure where all these people went, to be honest with you, but it's pretty crazy. You hit it when you said leadership. Companies are going to have to attract talent based on their culture, leadership, style, vibe, whatever you want to call it, like all of the internal makings of it. And I think that COVID exposed a lot of that too with the remote workforce and all of that. But at some point, a lot of these companies are trying to get people back in the office, and they've been trying for the last year. And people are reluctant because they got a taste of efficiency. I'm not even going to call it freedom. I'm going to call it efficiency. Mm -hmm. People realize that they went to an office 40 hours a week, and they commuted another 10, and they did 10 or 20 hours of work while they were there because they came home and did that 10 or 20 hours, and they know how long it really took. And that's it. And now they're stuck in a job that is potentially requiring them to come back to the office at least three or four days a week, if not every day. And they don't want to. And it's giving people a lot of time to think about what other things they'd like to do. And so there's that shift, too. It's not even just the workforce in general falling off. It's people moving laterally or going into different industries and with the digital creation space the way it is right now, so many people of all ages are finding that they can make a decent living doing some agency work or doing just their own content creation and their own podcast or YouTube channel, whatever you want to call it, like all kinds of stuff. It's a really interesting time for employers. And I think that they better get their heads on straight in this next few years or they're going to, some of them are going to be completely out of luck and literally not have a single employee left or be able to attract yeah. any because they haven't changed. I'm seeing it every day. We deal with this. We deal with the hiring aspect of it because people try to mm -hmm. use us with social media to get more employees. So I'm really aware of what's going on with it all. And it's really a bad situation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if there's one thing to, to take away as we wind down, like you said, you have to be putting actual thought and effort into what you're putting out into the world, into social media and realize that over the next 10 years, it's going to matter significantly more than it has for the past 10 years. Yeah. Are you talking about specifically as a potential employee or are you talking oh. from a business? Because I'm also thinking you just triggered another thought. If you're young, if you're 
preteen, teen, right now, even early 20s, and you're doing things on social media that are not appealing to potential employers, that's all going to get caught in the mix, and you're going to – it's going to be exposed. Like people are going to look mm-hmm. back and find you. That's what I thought you maybe <laughs> meant by that. But yes, from an employer yeah. standpoint, you're right about that too. Yeah. I think it goes both ways. There, You'll have positive and negative, you have positive and negative impacts of social media. The converse is also true. If you're young and you're putting out thoughtful, insightful things, yeah. guess what? You're going to have exactly no problem finding the job. So I think to your point, it's absolutely true. So Dan, if people want to get a hold of you, what's a good way to, to get in touch with you if they'd like to, to connect? Yeah, I'm everywhere. Flip Switch Social Media is the company. You can find us on all the platforms. And then Dan Peterson Official is my personal brand that I'm slowly building up. But uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure being on and I'd be happy to help anybody for free. Just if you have questions, comments, it's all about helping business owners. and That's what we do. Awesome. Thanks for being on. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Drake.